What's up? Meditate here. And in this video, we will be taking a look at the main fascia covering structures in the upper extremity. But first, we need to answer the questions, what is a fascia and how do we categorize them? So a fascia is just a connective tissue surrounding structures within the body. So here's a muscle, just a raw muscle within the body, and here's a fascia. It surrounds the muscles. Now, why do we need them? Well, one thing is that the fascia stabilizes and separates muscles from other internal organs. Fascia form compartments, especially in clinics, if you get patients with edema within the compartment that the fascia forms, we will get the so-called compartment syndrome, which could be very dangerous as blood supply may get cut off due to the pressure. Fascia also forms passage for nerves, blood vessels, and lymph. And this is also important to keep in mind, especially in people with chronic muscle pain. It doesn't necessarily have to be your muscles that's ill, it could be the fascia. So stretching exercises are an important factor which can stretch the fascia and help loosening it up. Fascia also functions as a storage medium for fat and water. And lastly, there are three types of fascias that we need to know. There are the superficial fascia, the deep fascia, and the visceral fascia. Okay, so here's the skin without removing any layers. If you remove just the layers of the skin, you will see the superficial fascia located right underneath the skin. And then when you remove the superficial fascia, you will see the deep fascia. The deep fascia surrounds individual muscles and groups of muscles to separate them into compartments. And when we talk about fascia within the body, it's most often the deep fascia we're talking about. So when you remove the deep fascia in enough muscles and bones to see an organ, we will see the visceral fascia that surrounds the organs within the body. So here we see the fascia covering the lungs called pleura. So that is the three types of fascias we have. And if you go back here, the fascia I showed you earlier was a deep fascia. All right, so finally, in this video, we're first going to look at the fascia of the shoulder. Then we will make a cross section of the arm and cover the main fascias there. Then we will cover the fascia in a cross section of the forearm and then do the same thing with the hand. So we will start with the fascia of the shoulders. So here we see all the muscles of the upper limb. Now, the fascias of the shoulders aren't that complicated as they don't form any significant compartments like they do in the rest of the upper limb. But the first fascia is this one, called the deltoid fascia, covering the deltoid muscle. Then we have the pectoral fascia, which covers the pectoralis major. Then, if you look at the posterior view of the shoulder, we will find the infraspinatus fascia, covering the infraspinatus muscle, and the supraspinatus fascia, for the supraspinatus muscle. So that was generally the most important fascias of the shoulders. Now let's do the fascias of the arm. The main fascia that the upper arm have is the brachial fascia, as you see here. And what's significant with this fascia is that it forms compartments. So if you look at the lateral view, you will see an anterior compartment and a posterior compartment, and they are separated by a brachial fascia. So if you make a cross section and look at the arm from this perspective, we will see the brachial fascia and the humerus in the middle. The brachial fascia is connected to the bone through intermuscular septa, called the medial intermuscular septa and the lateral intermuscular septa. And they form the flexor compartment and the extensor compartment. The extensor compartment mainly contains the triceps muscles. The flexor compartment, however, is actually divided into two compartments by the deep lamina or lamina profunda. Superficially, we will find the biceps brachii, and deeper to that, we will find the curacobrachialis and the brachialis muscles. Now, these compartments have names depending on whether they contain bone or not. The extensor compartment, in Latin, is called vagina osteofibrosa extensorum. The flexor compartment that contains bone is called vagina osteofibrosa flexorum. And the superficial compartment is called the vagina fibrosa flexorum. It doesn't contain bone, so it doesn't get the privilege of having the word osteo before the word fibrosa. So that was mainly the fascia of the arm. Then we have the fascia of the forearm, which is called the antebrachial fascia. Now let's make a transverse cut and look at it from this perspective. You will see the antebrachial fascia around the ulna and the radius. Between the ulna and the radius, there's the interosseous membrane. Then there are two deep fascia separating the forearm into compartments. The deep fascia are called the posterior intermuscular septum and the anterior intermuscular septum. From the anterior intermuscular septum, there's another fascia called the deep lamina separating the anterior compartment. All right, 
So that's the outline of the fascias and the forearm. Now we have a posterior compartment, an anterior compartment, and a lateral compartment. The posterior compartment consists of the extensor muscles, like the abductor pollicis longus, extensor digitorium, extensor digiti minimi, and extensor carpi ulnaris. In the lateral compartment, we have muscles like the brachioradialis, and extensor carpi radialis longus, and extensor carpi radialis brevis. Then in the anterior compartment, we have muscles like the flexor pollicis longus and the flexor digitorum profundus. Superficially, we have the muscles like the flexor carpi ulnaris, flexor digitorum superficialis, flexor carpi radialis, and pronator teres. Now we get the vagina osteofibrosa posterior, vagina osteofibrosa lateralis, vagina osteofibrosa anterior, and vagina fibrosa antebrachi. So that was all the fascias of the forearm. Now, let's do the fascia of the hand. Alright, the first thing we need to address are the retinoculums we have in the wrist. Once the antibrachial fascia reaches the wrist, it's going to form a thick band called the flexor retinoculum and an extensor retinoculum. These bands are crucial because they organize the blood flow and the tendons of the muscles in the forearm into compartments. Other fascias associated with structures in the hand is the palmar aponeurosis, which is a continuation of the deep fascia of the forearm that protects the underlying vasculature. Superficially to that, we have the superficial palmar fascia, while the dorsum of the hand have mainly the superficial dorsal fascia. Okay, so let's first understand the flexor and the extensor retinoculum by making a transverse cut like this, and look at the cross section from the wrist. First, we will see the distal row of the carpal bones, these are the trapezium, trapezoid, capitatum, and hamatum, right? And for orientation's sake, the thumb is here and the pinky is here, and the dorsum of the hand is here and the palm is here. So if we look at the hand, we're looking at a cross section of around this region and looking from this perspective. Okay, let's now add structures as we talk about them. First, we have the skin. Under the skin, we have the extensor retinoculum, and then we have the flexor retinoculum. Both form compartments. The extensor retinoculum is going to form six canals for the tendons of the extensor muscles to go through. The first canal, closest to the thumb, contains tendons of the abductor pollicis longus and extensor pollicis brevis. The second canal contains tendons for the extensor carpi radialis longus and the extensor carpi radialis brevis. The third canal contains tendons for the extensor pollicis longus. The fourth canal contains tendons for the extensor digitorum and the extensor indices. The fifth canal contains tendons for the extensor digiti minimi. And then the, finally, the sixth canal contains tendons for the extensor carpi ulnaris muscle. These tendons going through the canals that the extensor retinoculum form are grouped as the dorsal tendinous sheath, as you see here. So that means that each canal form a sheath around the tendons to protect them from damage. Awesome. Now, let's do the flexor retinoculum. The flexor retinoculum also form canals. The first canal it forms is called the carpal canal. The carpal canal contain the tendons for the flexor digitorum profundus and the tendons of the flexor digitorum superficialis. These eight tendons are grouped as a tendinous sheath, just like the extensors are. Then we have the flexor pollicis longus, which is also surrounded by its own tendinous sheath. Another structure you'll find in the carpal canal is the median nerve, so pressure in the carpal canal can press on the median nerve causing chronic pain. Another tendon you will find in the flexor retinoculum is the tendon of the flexor carpi radialis, which has its own tendinous sheath as well. And this is how they all look like, you will find three tendinous sheaths here on the palmar side. Then we have the ulnar canal, which contain the ulnar nerve, two ulnar veins, and one ulnar artery. Other structures we can find are the thermal muscles and the hypothermal muscles, and between them is the tendons for the palmaris longus, but if you make a transverse cut at the middle of the hand, you will find the palmaris longus continuing as the palmar aponeurosis, where the palmar aponeurosis is bound to the muscles of the thermal and hypothermal regions. So that was all the fascias that I wanted to cover of the upper limb. If you found this video helpful, please put a like, share, comment, whatever you find convenient to you. See you next time.